All right, good morning, everyone. <clears throat> good to be in the house of God today. Great to be in adult Sunday school. And everybody said amen. <clears throat> we have a lot to go through today and uh, excited about the opportunity to get in the Word of God. And uh, what a great atmosphere of prayer, great worship. Amen. <clears throat> I'll never understand how anybody could not want to give God high praise when today playoff games are going to be going and people are going to be acting like idiots. <laughs> All because of a pigskin getting, getting thrown across the field by human beings. And people come to church and they go, y'all a little bit too loud, a little too bit crazy. What's my statement? Uh, would David like attending your church? Would David like attending your church? Because David didn't have quiet church. David said, clap your hands, all you people. Shout unto the Lord with the voice of triumph. Dance, on, dance before the Lord with all your might. I mean, David was a worshiper. And the Bible said in the last days God was going to restore the tent of David. Not the ritualistic tent of Moses, but the tent of David. And uh, we need to have liberty in the Holy Ghost. Amen. <clears throat> I'm determined this year, every time somebody looks at me crossways as I give God praise, I'm determined to be more like David and be like David and say, I'm going to be even more indignant before the Lord. I don't care what you think about me. I don't care what you say about me. He's worthy of my very best. And I have nothing to apologize for. Praise God. <clears throat> Amen. <clears throat> I'm going to recommend, um, if you have an opportunity, go to find uh, First Pentecostal Church in Durham, North Carolina. I want you to go find Matt Tuttle's sermon. I want you to listen to it. And um, I wholeheartedly agree <clears throat> with the sermon that he preached. <clears throat> he did a study. Um, in his own church on the autopsy of a backslider. And he went through the demographics, the statistics of people that have stayed in the church. And you know, you know, the some of the first to leave were not the people that didn't worship. Did you know that? Well, you got quiet on me. That's all right. Amen. Liberty determines our connectedness to the kingdom of God. Because the Bible says where the spirit of the Lord there is liberty. And if I don't have liberty, where's the spirit at? And uh, so <clears throat> I want you to go back and listen to that. <clears throat> uh, First Pentecostal Church in Durham, North Carolina. Pastor Nathaniel Urshan. <clears throat> All right. Well, this morning, um, as you uh, stuff your faces and enjoy the coffee and the food, <clears throat> um, I want to I want to jump in and start covering uh, a subject that matters quite a bit to God. What matters quite a bit to the kingdom of God. Now we brought up um, <clears throat> last week. We talked about Ananias and Sapphira, <clears throat> and um, people don't realize how serious God takes sincerity. Amen. Um, God does not have a big. Uh, a big heart for hypocritical uh, pretense, pretense. Uh, he rebuked the Pharisees for making pretense of long prayers so that everybody could see them pray. But their heart, he talked about their inward, was white and sepulchral full of dead men's bones. God is an examiner of the heart. And Ananias and Sapphira, that story tells us some very important things about our relationship to the to the church and the body around us, then it does matter. Amen. And so we're going to kind of pick back up in this theme a little bit, but we're going to talk about a subject that is very, very important to God, and it's about building the kingdom of God. It's about uh, direction again for 24, direction for this year, direction for what God's wanting to do. We've been here six years. We're about to hit our seventh year. God's been so good. You know, me and my wife, we're moving back <clears throat> closer to the church. And the first time that we were here close to the church, it was just her and I <clears throat> and my children. And that was it. So we're uh, starting really good this year. Uh, we're not moving up here starting 
by ourselves. We're starting with a solid group of people. <clears throat> and I feel like there's some leadership beginning to develop, some personal leadership in our lives. Um, leadership is not position. Leadership begins with ourselves. And the, the whole idea is, is, again, nobody can lead anybody else unless they can, unless they can lead themselves first. And the Bible's really big on that. Uh, let them first be proved. So you got to have preparation before any position. <clears throat> but we are seeing a stepping into leadership. But what we're going to talk about today, <clears throat> I want you to pay very careful attention. <clears throat> I won't cough too much. It's getting better. Somebody's praying for me at that. This has been the longest bronchitis trip I've ever been on. We're moving over two months now <clears throat> of the cough that's been with me. But that's okay. As like the old uh, scripture, as long as I got breath in me, Psalms 150, let everything I have breath. Hey, I got breath still. I might cough, but I'm going to worship. Amen. So we're going to talk about servants. Everybody say servants. <clears throat> Not a real popular word. Not something people really want to do. Uh, in, the, in, the, in the years that we've been here, we've had plenty of people show up that have volunteered to lead. But it's very, very rare that people show up and go, I'd like to serve. Uh, everybody wants a position. Everybody wants to be a part of leadership. But the Bible <clears throat> has a little bit of a different uh, plan, different purpose. And if we're ever going to do what God wants us to do and, and build the kingdom effectively, we have to gain the revelation we're going to talk about today. The text that I want to start with right now is out of 1 Kings 10, chapter 4. And it says, when the queen of Sheba had seen all Solomon's wisdom and the house that he had built, the meat <coughs> of his table, the sitting of his servants, the attendance of his ministers and their apparel and his cupbearers and his ascent by which he went up unto the house of the Lord, there was no more spirit in her. <clears throat> now, the backdrop to this is pretty simple. David prepared abundantly to build the house of the Lord. But because David was a man of war, David um, was not allowed to build the house of God, but God allowed him to prepare abundantly. And he did prepare abundantly. But I want to make a statement here, Solomon had to do some work too. Nothing good ever comes from just handing a subsequent generation something they don't have to work for. And Solomon comes into his, his kingdom and Solomon begins to build the house of God and we know the great story, all the sacrifices, everything that was there. There's never been anything like it. It was a, an unbelievable temple that was built, the furniture that was built, just incredible. Well, the fame of Solomon, his wisdom, the Bible says he was one of the wisest men that has ever lived because God gave him a divine type of wisdom. And word got out around the world about what was going on in Jerusalem. And uh, dignitaries and friends and and world leaders all took trips there, and they wanted to see this wonderful house of God and this man named Solomon. And the Queen of Sheba is one of them that comes. She brings with her camels laden down with all kinds of, of wealth and gifts and presents. Let me just throw this out here for context. That's where the scripture that says that thy gift will make room for itself. Okay, that does not mean that it's talking about your calling. It's not talking about your singing ability. That is talking about how Eastern, Near Eastern kingdoms would gain an audience with another king. The bigger your gift, the quicker to the, to the throne. <clears throat> so just to fix that. Um, what will get you in the presence of the king is not your gift, it's your consecration. <clears throat> That'll please. <clears throat> and so the queen of Sheba comes, and uh, she brings her old entourage, and everybody comes through. 
And she comes in, and she is just blown away. That is, at the stage that we're at, we're in a, we're in a new season here. and It's a great season. It's a season of understanding, of responsibility, and what we're going to see today, and some of the things we're going to start talking about in Sunday school. Um, this is a part of getting all of us on board, on the same page, um, you know, during prayer, everything, getting on the same page for everything. She comes in and she notices first, she notices King Solomon, right? He's the king. You know, that's probably the figure you're going to see first. If you go to the White House, you're probably not going to focus on the, the guy opening the door, right? You're probably going to focus on whoever's president, okay? Because that is, for that house is the power figure of the house. So her first connection is the king, but she doesn't stop there. <clears throat> she starts looking around, and she notices Solomon. She begins to look around at the house that was built. <clears throat> Anybody that says having excellence in a church building doesn't matter, doesn't have a revelation, because this is a reflection of what we think of our God. Amen. So we're not going to have a rundown church building, even though we're leasing this. And we've done a great job here. Everybody that comes through says this is so nice in here. But it costs a lot of money to do this. And some people say, well, it's not yours. Don't fix it. <clears throat> well, I don't believe in that. Because God is in this place. <clears throat> and this is a place for him. And so we, we want to be excellent. And uh, she starts looking around at the house, all the elaborate Crown work, every, I mean, just everything. The, the crown molding, and this, which is probably gold molding then. <clears throat> everything. She's just blown away by the house. She's checking out the stuff. And, and notice it says here, the meat of his table. Why does it say the meat of his table? Because that shows abundance. I mean, the table's filled with so much meat. And if you ever had dignitaries in those days, they would actually put more than you could eat out there. Because it was a little bit of <clears throat> an egotistical bragging. You know, look at how great we are. Look at how good God's blessed us. Man, we can put meat out here for days. And so she notices all the meat that's at the table. But, but then notice, she, 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 this is interesting. The queen of Sheba is moving from the king to the house to the meat. Now what? To the servant. And it says she notices the sitting of the servant. The servants stood out to her. And the attendants of his ministers. This is another layer of servants. And his cupbearers. And then she notices how Solomon ascends or approaches the house of his God. Boy, I could stop right there for a long time. People notice how you walk into church. <clears throat> she noticed how he ascended into the house of the Lord. You know one of the prayers, everybody know one of the key prayers that Solomon prayed? Teach me how to go in and how to come out. It wouldn't hurt some of us to get a revelation of how to walk in and approach the house of God. Amen. This, we're coming to the king's house. We're coming to the Lord's house. This isn't my house. This isn't your house. So I'm going to just go ahead and say there's a reason. I, I appreciate, again, as, as you know, we'll have guests and visitors, and we're so glad. Randy, so glad you're here. Amen. <laughs> I'm not throwing this out here. I know, I know you don't have a suit and a tie on, so I'm not targeting you. I just want you to know that. But I'm defending for this day that we live in, that, that the world wants to say we need to get more comfortable and casual in the house of God. Amen. I want to be more. I want to be more for the things of God. Amen. It's a tradition, okay? Wearing a tie and a suit's a tradition. It, that's really all. There's no scriptural verse that says wear a suit and a tie to church. Do you know that? But I don't do everything because I, I have a scriptural verse. 
I've been, man, I grew up in church. This is what you did. It's a tradition. And Paul said, hold fast the traditions that were handed down to you. Not all traditions are bad. Right? Not all traditions are bad. It kind of frustrates me when I go to a nice restaurant. There's somebody in flip-flops now. While I'm eating a $100 steak when I can finally afford it. I don't want to see their little toes while I'm eating. No, dress up. (coughs) Right? And we're living in the epicenter of dress down. (coughs) If they get dressed at all. Amen. So I just threw that out there. I, 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 I want my boys, I'm still, I want to present myself when I approach the house of God. I want people, you know, it's amazing. We'll go to the store after church and, you know, we're all dressed up. And you know what we always get? Where are you, where, where you, you, where are you coming from? Church. Your boys look so handsome. I don't, I never walk into a grocery store normal dress, and have anybody remark on my children. But when they have their Sunday clothes on, it's amazing. You walk in, it just speaks. Why does it stand out to people? Because they're no longer used to anybody dressing up. What's Walmart? You want to feel good about yourself? Go to Walmart at 10 p.m. Come on now. You know that's the truth. Like I'm getting weary with every I'm getting weary with grown adults and, and teenagers wearing pajamas every day. You know, when I grew up, my dad stopped me at the front door. He said, Where are you going? I'm going out. Not like that. Isn't it a shame that you don't even hear this taught anymore? Somebody says, well, this is the church. You ain't supposed to teach that stuff. Well, the church used to be the launch pad of society. Good families went to good churches, and they worked together, and they produced good, upstanding citizens. And I, I, I could get really, I, thank you, I could get really bogged down here. But the Queen of Sheba begins to notice, I want to stand out. My difference doesn't bother me. My my separation doesn't bother me. It's the highest honor on the planet to be separated to Him. And if you don't feel that way, that's between you and God. But I don't separate because of rules. I separate because God wants me to be separated. The Bible makes it clear, and he says, well, that's Old Testament. No, he he talks about vessels of honor. In the house, there's vessels of gold and silver, of wood and earth and hay and all that stuff. I want to be a vessel that's picked off the shelf all the time. And you know the, the vessels that get used every day are the vessels that are separate. There was no vessels in the tabernacle or the temple that were ever used for common things. That's the precedent for know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. I'm privileged to separate to God and not watch all that filth out there. I'm privileged not to pump porn through my my eyeballs and taint this vessel. It's a privilege to say we're not going to do that. We're not going to have that. Why? Because it's a high honor to be separated for Him. And I think too many people walk away from separation simply because one or two things, they don't understand it, or two, they just just love the world a whole lot more than God. What does the Bible say? Love not the world, neither the things that are of the world. Because if you do, you have not the love of the Father in you. So we'll talk about that one day, but somebody ought to tell me what the world is so I can make sure I don't love it. (laughs) Amen. Uh, You know, it's real simple. It's almost like the further you get from carnal worlds, the closer you get to spiritual God. Now, God didn't call us to be isolationists, right? We don't isolate. We infiltrate. Amen. But, But here's what I love about, can I just, can I just, can I just deviate from the path quickly here? 
He said, I'm sending you as sheep among wolves. Isn't that great? See, our problem is, is when we infiltrate the world, they identify us instantly. Do wolves try to dress up like sheep? That's the whole fairy tale, right? He said, there's wolves among you. They look just like sheep. But he goes, you guys, I want you to go out there not as wolves among wolves. Don't dress up like a wolf. You know how many churches are trying to win wolves by dressing like a wolf? It's all right. She's, she's leaving. She's leaving. We have a major drug epidemic. Amen. Why don't we pray for her right now, right here in this room. Father in heaven, she's somebody's child. She's somebody's grandchild. God, she sleeps on the street. She's hooked on all kinds of drugs. And God, we need to have compassion. Oh, Ooh, I, oh God. You know what you're feeling right now? You're feeling the heartbeat of God. Oh God, help us save somebody from the clutches of addiction. Help there be a draw in the Holy Ghost of deliverance in this place, God. We need deliverance, God, in this city of Portland, Lord. Ooh, we need, ooh, I feel the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. You know, as a church, we have to be safe and we have to protect the church and the people. But we have to do it in a way that doesn't fail compassion. Amen. That doesn't mean that we become a, a harm reduction center where we give out needles here and all that. But, but. I've talked to her. She's not always she's not always fired up like that. Amen. It uh, breaks my heart what's happening in this city. And uh, that right there, that 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 precious soul, I need to stir every one of you to walk in this building and s- stop sitting around and not praying. But that ought to stir somebody to pray. I don't come here for me. I come here that God uses me to make a difference. Amen. Now, drug addicts are very difficult. I know that I'm a licensed drug counselor. But I'm going to tell you something. God wants us to be compassionate. Amen. And uh, we need to determine, God, let me, let me win my city before they end up. Because that's the devil's plan to blow somebody's mind to where they can't even rationally think. Thank you, Lord, for that reminder. Hey, I believe angels could follow that, that young lady. There's always hope. Praise God. Man, I feel the Holy Ghost. So the Queen of Sheba is in the room and She's she's seeing all this stuff, and she notices the servants. And that's what I really want to focus on, because for most of us, our typical focus when we come into anywhere is the head. We don't have a preacher religion. Let me explain that. This, This church, this work can't be built on. Now, every organization, every church has to have leadership. Every flock has to have shepherds. But we make a big mistake when we come in and our focus is 100% on the leadership. If God doesn't focus that way, we shouldn't either. Now, I'm not saying that the Bible doesn't clarify. The Bible does say give double honor to them that labor in the word. And they, they, they do it well. Okay, I mean, the Bible does have things to talk about honoring leadership. We honor leadership in the world. Right? 
And uh, it shouldn't bother anybody to honor leadership, right? Young people need to honor their parents. That's leadership. It says, children, honor thy father and thy mother. So <clears throat> that leadership, honoring leadership, is in every facet or layer of our lives. We honor uh, police chiefs when we need them, right? And people in leadership positions, that's why I've said I don't care who is president. I, I don't care. Now, I've got different politics or I've got opinions. I vote biblically. I do not vote politically. I vote the Bible. <clears throat> but I don't care if I don't like the person. I'm still going to honor the position. <clears throat> now, that makes people mad, but I'm going to tell you, we're losing something. And this is for both sides. This is for donkeys and the, and, and, and elephants. <clears throat> we got to stop this disrespect. The Bible says pray, pray for your leaders. And so I do. <clears throat> when I don't like the guy in the leadership position, I pray. The scripture in the Old Testament says, Lord, let his days be short in his leadership. <clears throat> That's out of the book of Psalms. Amen. I'm being facetious. But we need, to, we need to carry ourselves a little bit better. That's why I've said many times Facebook is not a place for church people to be posting a bunch of political things. Don't tell me you're going to try to win the people around you and all you're doing is dumping politics online. <clears throat> How can you win somebody you're fighting with over a president? <clears throat> Amen. It's good teaching. And so the typical focus is often this, but the Queen of Sheba had an understanding. Yes, the king matters, but what got her attention was how everything around the king worked together. She was amazed at the synchrony of the house. She was amazed at how the servants sat, how the ministers ministered, how she just was blown away at the whole picture, not just its leader. <clears throat> and so the Bible calls us, and this is important, it calls us leadership, even if you're a parent, if you're a Sunday school leader, if you're a pastor, all of us, no matter what role we play in the church, and this is where it's difficult, because the corporate world doesn't really teach this. The corporate world doesn't often care what you think, how you think. Here's the list of rules. You do this, and if you, you are judged by the rules, and that's it. And, and you're just another number. I can replace you. <clears throat> okay, but when you come into the church, the Bible says that leaders, pastors, all of us, but essentially it brings pastors because a pastor is God called leadership for a local flock, is he goes, you don't exercise lordship. <laughs> Let me give you an example of lordship to this big, strapping, handsome fella here. <laughs> He's looking around. That'd be me walking up saying, hey, I told you to go empty that trash. <laughs> now, Brother Rick, and just because he's such a good man, he would probably just kind of sit there and think, I want to smash you, but I'm not going to do it. Right? Because lordship doesn't produce good followers. You want to know why? Because it's, it drives people. Okay? <clears throat> if you're having to drive somebody, I've always said this, either you're in the wrong position or you're chasing a goat. But see, if a, if a good shepherd loves his people, and, and sometimes, see, the sheep will follow, goats you got to harness. you got to get a hold of a goat. And I, I preached years ago, don't be a goat. Don't be a goat. Somebody say, don't be a goat. Because God separates the goats. <laughs> submission is important in the kingdom of God. It does talk about submission. But submission is directed out of proper leadership. 
authority that is governed by love seeks to serve. But authority governed by position seeks to be served. Okay? And so, again, it makes it a lot easier, but somebody says, well, how come you, you're driving me? Well, maybe you're a goat. Stop being a goat. Um, and, and I get really irritated now that goat now means greatest of all time. <laughs> Isn't it crazy how we take all the biblical negative words and make them into positive words? Have you thought about that? He's a beast. He's the goat. You ever thought about that? That was free. So God calls you and I to be servant. I'm called to be a servant. You're called to be a servant. I want everybody to say, I'm called to be a servant. Okay. Is servant, what do servants do? Is serve a noun or a verb? What's a verb? That's doing. So if you're not serving, are you a servant? There you go. All right, so God calls us to be servants, not lords. I'm so thankful that nobody tries to uh, buff my shoe. Um, that'd be a little weird, buff my shoe. I want you to think about this. God gives a king a kingdom, right? A king has a kingdom. Notice that little difference there, A-I-N. Ah, kingdom is a king's domain. But what makes a kingdom a kingdom? There are people in the kingdom. And a good king takes care of his people. Are you with me? And so... A king's domain incorporates the collective cooperation of everyone serving the kingdom. Okay, so what does the Bible say so much about God on earth? What's his, his thing in earth? God's kingdom. That's what, thy, what do we pray? Thy kingdom. Well, what makes it a kingdom? There's a king, and there's servants. We serve the king, and I know we're not comfortable with this language, and he serves us. I listened to a preacher the other day say something that turned a light bulb on in my head. I'll preach it, but I'm going to give it away right now. We're in covenant. If you live right with God, you're in covenant with God. Right? If you're obedient to what God wants, you're in covenant. What is a covenant? It's an agreement between two parties. What does that covenant come from? Old Testament suzerain vassals. In other words, it was based off of a, a covenant relationship between a king and his vassals or his servants. And the idea was this. Here's the laws. Here's what I want. Here's what I want you to do. If you do what you're supposed to do, if you hold your end of the bargain, I'll hold my end of the bargain. You want to hear language like that in the New Testament? If, if, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and I will be. There's the language. If you do your end, I'll do my end. This is why I want to be obedient. This is why I, I don't want to fight anything the Bible tells me to do because that's my constitution. You want to know why? Because if I do my end of the deal, you ready for this? I can go to prayer and say, God, it's your turn. Now that makes some of y'all uncomfortable because your view of God is not a healthy view maybe. But God made it clear. Look at the Old Testament. He told the Israelites, he goes, if you'll do this, I'll fight your battles for you. Why wouldn't you want to be obedient? So if I do my end of the covenant, I can say, God, 
I'm expecting you to do your part of the bargain. I hope that helps somebody with a revelation of why we serve God, why we're obedient to the Scriptures. It's a covenant relationship. I want God to do His part, and God's not going to do His part if I'm not doing my part. <laughs> and so, it's a kingdom. It's a domain. The king is over the domain, and this is like in a microcosm. A church has a pastor. I'm an under-shepherd of the great shepherd. And we are sheep. Now, you're never going to hear me say, like some preacher, sheep are dumb. No, sheep are not dumb. Sheep are just smart enough to know that it's safer to follow somebody that will protect them. Amen. And um, <coughs> so God gives us leadership. And the Bible says, be not many masters. You know, nobody should just wake up and everybody wants to be a pastor because the Bible says that for, for, for those individuals, they have a greater condemnation. I will be held at a higher standard of accountability. Sometimes it would be easier to live without that burden. But how I respond and treat and lead every person God lets me lead, He holds me at a higher accountability. <laughs> you get to go home and go to bed. Amen. And get away with stuff because that's what it's just part of it. It's like at Walmart, CEO at Walmart, they're going to be held to a higher degree. Right? They can't get away with certain things, but an average employee today can get away with anything. <laughs> Sister Christina, who's a GM for many years, half her entire life, uh, said amen. And so kingdoms have servants. But here's the revelation everybody in this room has got to get. There's a kingdom, a domain of the king, and a church has its own sphere of influence, our own flock, our own fold. We have leadership. We're servants. All of us are serving mutual submission together for the higher good. But the reality of a domain is that in the kingdom of God, we're all parts of the whole. Every one of us is a part of the whole. And sometimes the most difficult thing in this selfish world, because let's just be honest, this flesh is selfish. It's just naturally selfish. I mean, think about it. Survival instinct. If you're on an island with two other people, and there's one little cake left. Prove your selfishness right then and there. Not a lot of people I know would say, you know what, I, let me die first. Do I have anybody in this room that's not trying to be super spiritual today? <laughs> like the Donner Party. Nobody was saying, tell you what, let me sleep outside tonight. So you can have something to eat in the morning. If you don't know the Donner Party, you have no idea. That's a sick story. But we are all parts of the whole. And the Bible says that love is meant to be the center of everything that we do. So love is the motivator. Love is the initiator. That's why the Bible said that if you have not love, you can prophesy all day long. And it's just a sounding brass and a tinkling tongue. <laughs> God is not so much interested in your giftings and your spiritual giftings, and your prayer life, and all that stuff, if you don't have love. Why are you here? If, if you're, well, I'm here to serve. Well, do you love? Because if we're missing love, service is dead. It's ineffective. <laughs> and so we are all parts of the whole. We say parts of the whole. Now, this is where we get in trouble. <laughs> because we don't seem to understand that each one of us makes a mark. Romans chapter 12 and 3, For I say, through the grace given unto me to every man that is among you and woman, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think. What a great reminder. 
Everybody say, I'm not all that in a bag of chips. But we can all get to feeling pretty important, can't we? Man, they need me. We said, well, put it in perspective. Your need is as great as your ability to serve. How people need you is as great as your ability to serve. There can be needs, but if you don't know how to serve, needs aren't met. But don't think you're so important that you're above everybody else. All right, well, I pray more than they do. Well, that doesn't mean you're better than nobody. You know, I, I, my favorite statement was, I don't pray because I'm spiritual. I pray because I'm not spiritual. Hello? That's why you meet people that walk around and they, my, I'm just a prayer warrior. I get really, really scared of people that boast of being prayer warriors. You know what? Bears don't wear name tags. You ever met a bear that says, see that? I'm a bear. You ever seen a bear do that, right? A bear just goes, you sh bear shows up, what are you doing? It's a bear. Right? Bears don't wear name, t name tags. Prayer warriors don't wear name tags. <laughs> Hello? You know, uh, smart people don't wear name tags that say I'm smart. Off, yeah, God help me. I gotta get this flesh under control a little bit. I'm gonna say things that are gonna make somebody mad. But look at what it says. Don't think so high of yourself, but think soberly. According as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. We all got one thing in common. We all got a measure of faith. And that's where we ought to start. Not my God. You've been living for God for 20 years. No, I got a measure of faith. What you got? I got a measure of faith too. And you know what? If we can all work together, my God, look at what happens. My measure and your measure and your measure and your measure. Right? There is a correlation between people groups and faith. There just is. The more people you get together that believe, the greater the atmosphere of faith becomes. Okay, have you? How many of you have ever felt as much faith by yourself as when you've been in a fiery church service where faith was everybody's got faith and God, they, everybody just thinks God's about to literally do miracles? Anybody ever just feel that all by yourself, sitting in the sitting on the couch eating a can of Pringles? <laughs> right, but something about being around everybody else's measure of faith when it's connected to the persons around you, <clears throat> something about it, it just, it just, it links. Amen. So does doubt. I'd rather negative Nancy just stayed home and doubted at home. I heard somebody the other day talk about it. It was so funny to me. I think it, it was Brother Wilmoth, I think. He said his personal opinion why Joshua only sent two in the promised land is because he said, we ain't about to give a quorum to stop. <laughs> Moses sent in 10 and ate one or 12 and 10 of them won. He goes, this time two of us going. Right? We're not going to give too many negative people the, the, enough room to run. At least there'll be one versus the other. <laughs> Amen. That was pretty good. And so he said, verse 4, for as we have many members in one body and all members have not the same office. Okay, so we're not all going to serve in the same position. There are offices in the kingdom of God. Not everybody is called to be in a, in a position of leadership, as we know leadership. Now, everybody would like that because some people think it's fun to boss people around. But that's not leadership in the church. Leadership is trying to serve the body, right? Guiding the body, leading the body. But, you know, that shepherd had a crook. He had two sides of that thing. One was to reach in and wrap it around the neck of a sheep that was wandering astray and whoop, pull it in. Bet you didn't feel good when that crook of that shepherd's staff went around that neck and yanked it. But it's a whole lot better than falling off the cliff. Right? 
And then the other side of that rod, that wasn't for the sheep. That was for predators. That was to whack things that needed to be whacked. Amen. So there's a big difference between being pulled on and whacked on. Amen. Now, I know some people that live for God, they think that if they're not being whacked, they're not, they're not getting appropriate leadership. We, no, no, let, God wants to pull you. God draws. The Bible says, except God draw them. I've never seen anybody run through the front door with God chasing them with a stick. Whack, whack, whack. Now, God will use circumstances to draw you. But God is never going to force you. And that's where sometimes as a pastor it can be tricky. Because sometimes I'm like, God, just force them. You know, they don't know it's good for them. Right? You ever been a parent? <laughs> you ever want to force your kids to do, do something? Yeah, you can force them all day long. Doesn't mean they're going to learn nothing. But you can try to, you can try to, Pull them. You can pull them right into their room and ground them. Amen. But uh, we believe in discipline, not punishment. Punishment's whack. Discipline pulls. It's a trellis. Amen. And so, everybody say, we're all members of the body. We're meant to make an impact. i got to hurry up and finish here. 1 Corinthians 12, 26, listen, people say, well, I, I don't, it doesn't matter what I do in the body. It doesn't matter. I can do what I want. I can, I can come to church, and while people are praying, I can sit out in the hallway and just chit-chat. And it doesn't matter what I do. You know, no big deal. Who cares? There's enough people praying. It's not what the Bible says. The Bible says what you do matters. One affects all. Now, this isn't a popular statement. This isn't something we like to hear because um, we don't like to live under this. But it says, and whether one member suffer, all the members suffer with it. Or if one member is honored, all the members rejoice with it. In other words, there's an underlying principle here that, that there's no such thing as being a member of a church and not affecting the church you're a part of. Everything we do matters to the body around us because we're members of the body. And so we need to, we're going to start moving into when we're pulling this, this part of firm foundations is part of being what God wants us to be. There is a call to biblical membership. God wants us to be biblical members of a church body. And I've always said that this is something I have never lived in a city that chafes more at just planting in one place, and serving there. I have never lived anywhere where more people just go from church to church to church to church to church to church to church. When you ask them, where do you go to church? Oh, I go to a different one every week. Well, you're not a member of anything. You're just, you're, you're a tumbleweed. <laughs> you ever seen them blow across the road? I put names on them. There goes so-and-so. They're going to another church, <laughs> right? If I've said this before. Brother Rick, if you planted a bush in your front yard and I came and ripped it out and I moved it five feet away, left it there for one week, then ripped it back out, moved it another place, do you think it's going to really grow? Why won't it grow? Because it's not rooted. You can't go deeper without roots. Amen. You know, that's what the olden days used to say. Put your roots down. You want to know why the world was a whole lot better back in the day? Because people put their roots down and became productive members of their community. Now people don't even care about their neighbors. Some of you don't even know who your neighbor is. Woo. Or they might know who you are. Let me hurry up and finish here. We're closing right here. So we're going to get into these, but what's, what's the two things that a biblical member does? Real simple. It's all biblical. 
they give abundantly, and they serve without hesitation. Those two things are defining characteristics of being a member. They give abundantly and they serve without hesitation. They are not CEOs. Now, all y'all think you know what that means. Anybody want to take a guess what CEO means? They're not Christmas and Easter only. That ain't a biblical member. And we got too many people today that say, oh, I'm on the member roster. No, but are you a biblical member? It's a big difference, and I'm going to be calling this church to become biblical members. Give abundantly, serve without hesitation. Amen. They are dynamic, not static. And we're going to jump into this uh, next week, starting 1 Corinthians 12. What is static? They don't move. They do nothing. That's not what God calls us to be. Here's what I want to present this year as we close. We're going to be going through this. We all have to look at this house. Not as our second job. But our first job. Well, I don't get paid. Okay. What does the Bible say? It talks about serving. Serving. You know what you get when you serve the King of Kings? Protection. Favor. Blessing. You get his end of the bargain. I, I've been paid far too much already that I'd never have a question to serve. In fact, the Bible said he paid a ransom. You will never be able to pay. But we get an entitled spirit in this generation that says, I don't have time for the king. No, I work my world around the king. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and all of these things. So I want to, I, we're moving closer. I just think everybody needs to start praying, God, I need to get closer. Yep. So a lot of great things going to happen this year. We're going to spend a lot of time on this. Um, I'm going to challenge all of us. Come to Sunday school with a, an open heart to be challenged. Because what more does God want from each of you? Amen? Well, let's take a quick break. And uh, let's have church. Amen. Anybody excited for what God's going to do today?